thank you so much everyone first of all all the lovely audiences who are here uh, you we have been getting a lot of messages and uh, a lot of suggestions as well from a lot of people from teachers uh, from students researchers in agriculture uh, and they keep suggesting the kind of talks and the master classes they want to hear so welcome everyone greetings we welcome you here officially to the second session of edoras master class today we have with this henry gordon smith he is one of the leaders i would say he uh, you know in in vertical farming urban agriculture controlled environment agriculture and he has seen it all i mean like he has a ted talk to his name he is the founder and ceo of agritecture one of the leading firms in the world when it comes to consulting on vertical farming or greenhouse or a controlled environment agriculture he's a pro so we we are all ears uh and we uh, and some of us have already seen your ted talk as well you are a great hustler there's hardly an edtech summit around vertical farming where we don't see you so uh we're very excited about this henry first of all welcome to edoras master class and we really look forward to your session before you start i mean like i would also we would also want to know your quick journey as somebody who traveled around the world somebody uh who how he, you became a leader in this domain what prompted you the vision the mission that you have in your life when it comes to agriculture and urban agriculture and how it can solve food problems for the world quickly in first 2 3 minutes and then the floor will be all yours for the master class okay thank you so much it's a great honor to be here and what an exciting platform to share ideas which is something i'm extremely passionate about so a little bit on the origin story since that was the request you know i i sound american but my mother's czech my father's british my dad's a civil engineer and we traveled the world so from a very early age i had a global outlook which is probably one of the most important things to know about me so i was born in hong kong i grew up in hong kong tokyo germany czech republic and i graduated high school in moscow russia and then i went to canada to study political science and although i i liked the topic um i found really my niche when it came to sort of environmental security and i was really interested in water wars and how policies can protect or uh, reduce the protection for our scarce resources like water and and through that process i really became interested in food and the connection between water and food so as i finished my graduation i wanted to find a way to solve or respond to the climate crisis and find my fit and in order to do that it's very important as the young person to get the skills the experience but also to build a a brand and a story so that you can break your pathway into a new career and so what i did well was that i i was comfortable with blogging in the early days of blogging i had worked for my university blogging about student life and some other jobs so what i did is i started to create some blogs around topics related to sustainability i was interested in and some were about urban planning some were about um, water which i was really passionate about and one was called agriculture and that really created a framework for me to research this topic and share it and the topic is of course urban agriculture and that was in 2011 and so as i ran that blog i started getting more experience so the way i really broke into the sector was i think taking ownership over my ideas and my perspectives in a new industry but then also complementing that with real world skills i worked in some farms i volunteered at farms i started to get educated online in the ways that you are with the knowledge i needed and i built an archive of data that has proved to be a good foundation for our consulting services now so it, i guess i'll say it took many years um to to break through and i guess to answer another part of your question i mean i'm a nomad now because the demand for our services are global i'm a global citizen uh so very from the very beginning of the business we were focused on on international uh climate and and food security issues our first two clients one was in baltimore united states and the other one was amman jordan so from the very beginning it was you know multiple continents and that kind of work and a few years ago uh it just i was traveling so much to speak at events that it just i was never home so it didn't make sense to have an apartment anymore so i sort of embraced the nomad life and i live out of a suitcase and i i travel the world wonderful wonderful i'm like there's so many keywords that you have spoken in this just 5 minutes talk and those are the keywords that define a doer i mean like you know a nomad a digital nomad i mean like somebody who's living out of a suitcase a rebel and and, and what not i mean like you know seriously uh, and also a global citizen wonderful that's exactly what we're talking about you know i think you know it's so inspiring 
when we understand what you have done, I think the first thing that we can learn of all the students and everybody who are actually interested in entrepreneurship is that the first thing that you do in your domain is build a community. That's what Henry did through agriculture blog. He started writing blogs and that's the easiest way you can do that. You can, I'm like, you can also start producing content in social media and all of that. Once you have the community, once you have an audience, it's all your game then. You have passionate people who believe in what you are following and what you believe in. And they actually believe in your, in your initiative and your startup. So that's awesome. Yeah, I think I think even more than the belief, like it, it you teach your audience teaches you things, right? They tell you what they're interested in, and I think a lot of people miss the fact that when you when you blog or you create content, it's actually great market research. It's a great chance to discover where are gaps in the market, where are knowledge gaps, where are the where's the biggest demand, what are the profiles of those customers that are planning farms that need services, need software, etc. So I think like that's a key piece that a lot of people miss is that you know beyond building your brand and building an audience that you can then leverage or potentially you know, monetize, it's actually about getting a lot of feedback for them. It's a real collaboration between agriculture and um, our audience. And you know, we sometimes we involve them in even you know, writing blog posts and we get to meet them in person at workshops. So you know, really getting to know that community over many years, um, certainly as you mentioned, has been valuable. So should we, should we get started? I mean, there's a lot to cover. It's a masterclass. So. Okay, okay, wonderful, sure. So let's get started. Uh, the floor is all yours. Uh, I'm putting you on the is spotlight. It, is it the right and time we'll to up. start? Okay. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I mean, like we we still we have max two hours for this session. Okay, the audience, this is how the masterclass would go. The session would begin with Henry. He would complete his session. Once that ends, we will have the Q and A. Now, before the Q and A begins, after the session, you can also post your questions in the Q and A, and we will pick them. And maybe we'll read it to Henry or he can read it himself. And then we'll also pull some people who are willing to share their video and come to the spotlight and they can ask questions directly to Henry. And we'll have the wonderful AMA then. So Henry, all, all said, this is, the floor is yours. Uh, we're all ears. I'm putting you on spotlight. Okay, great. So, you know, this is a masterclass. So the way I sort of approached this was I wanted to give you a, a, almost like a brain dump of critical information about urban agriculture and also a lot of methodologies to think strategically. So trying to set you up for a foundation. And what I'm presenting today is a little bit of background, a little in specific methodologies, information to consider, but also um, these are just small previews from our agriculture commercial urban farming class, which is an entire class that you can take online to learn everything you would need to know to plant a commercial urban farm. So I just need permission to share my screen and we can get going. And I'm calling in today from the Czech Republic. If you've ever been, it's a beautiful place. Lovely, gun. absolutely lovely country. Uh, a little bit, bit worse connection in the countryside, but I think we're going to be fine. Okay. So get calm, okay? Because a full on masterclass here. So let's get in. I look forward to your questions as they come. You can reach out, to me, email me my real email you can call me with questions for them and share some lessons and best practices my take on the industry on my instagram at the agritech so uh, who am i i'm a, an ag tech speaker i've spoken in five contents about the topic of urban agriculture and controlled environment agriculture um i'm a nomad so as i mentioned i live out of a suitcase i travel the world and um, you know, very, very often uh, seeing farms in different climates, different scales, different markets entirely. Uh, I'm a consultant. I really enjoy consulting. I love solving problems. I love hearing people's ideas about new farms, new technologies, and helping them fill in the gaps with data and strategy and connections. And I manage an incredible team that's also global uh, and around the world. And we've got agronomists, uh, horticulturalists, agricultural engineers, uh, economists, sustainability managers, researchers. And together as a multidisciplinary team, we execute tons and tons of consulting work for clients around the world. So this is a little bit of my job is I get to visit facilities and, you know, we're talking today about urban agriculture, but there's different types and, and I'll introduce those in a moment. But these are some of the farms that I visited recently. Little Leaf Farms is really interesting because it's the largest uh, greenhouse and leafy green producer in the Northeast where there's a lot of population centers uh, growing in this controlled environment method. Now, big greenhouses like this are not necessarily new in other parts of the world, but they're relatively novel 
in the United States. What I like about this one is that it's got a unique innovation. You see this mezzanine that I'm on. Well, below it, they have another layer of production under artificial lights for the younger plants. So what I like about this is it's almost getting, you know, blurring the lines between a vertical farm, which is on the right, and a greenhouse. And you know, there's multiple layers of production. And we're starting to see that the sort of innovations between these two different types of growing food are overlapping. And we're seeing that across the food system. And that hybridization is something I also write about and, and something I'm interested in. Um, when it comes to Dubai, where the largest vertical farm in the world is now located uh, with this Emirates Crop One Holdings project, and yes, that's Emirates, the luxury airline, uh, basically they wanted to reduce the need for testing of, of product that they're importing. So they're importing salad greens and then their salads and putting it on planes. They serve 250,000 meals a day out of Dubai. And so it, you know, it's important to them to reduce the costs and to improve food quality and food safety. I, I think it's a really interesting reason to build a vertical farm. And, and I like the fact that you know, vertical farming and all of urban ag, you can be thought about from you know, what's the problem you're trying to solve. And that's something I'll remind you of a lot today. And I think what they did really well here is they've targeted a specific problem and they've designed a farm around that. And this farm is actually less automated than you would expect for a large $40 million uh, you know, premium vertical farm facility. That's because the Emirates have, in, in their words, to me, has great experience staff and teaching the skill to operate this farm. So the point being that there's a lot of possibilities here. Do some background on, on how I, um, what I do, how I visit farms. A little bit of background on agriculture that we can get into the meat of the presentation. As I mentioned, in 2011, I started a blog that became quite popular. And, and the short story is that organically, people started requesting consulting services for me. And I identified different consulting services that with my team of experts, we could execute. And this is a, an outline of some of the services that we typically execute. Overall, you know, the way I approach business is I'm not trying to build just a business. I'm trying to actually build an industry. I'm trying to accelerate the whole sector because I believe that together we can do a lot more than on our own. And so that's why I try to think very um, analytically and, and, and produce tools and research and education because I really want to help the whole sector rise up. And, and we want to be a part of that in accelerating that transition to smarter and more resilient agriculture, which we believe urban and controlled environment agriculture, these are, these are some of the ways we can have more uh, smart, sort of tech-enabled and resilient uh, agriculture. Here's just a, a short list of some of the milestones that our humble company has achieved. And, you know, I'm really proud of this as an entrepreneur and especially the team members that help execute this. You know, I get to, to lead the company, but so much of the work is done by incredible people um, that, you know, aren't, aren't always in, the, in the, the limelight. So, you know, we started the first urban ag tech consulting firm. Like there was no one doing these, providing these services globally, answering these questions. What can I grow in this building? What should I grow? What's the CapEx? What's the ROI? You know, what's the difference between a greenhouse and vertical farm? Like this information it isn't really that freely available now, and it was much less available back then. We ran workshops all around the world, again, on an education model. And in those workshops, we developed methodology planning these farms. We've been utilizing different ways for 10 years now. We've worked on really cool projects like Kimball Musk's um, Spoot Project, which was the world's first vertical freighter, basically 10 containers, 10 entrepreneurs. Um, you know, let's let's see what they can do. We also worked on a, a very exciting premium vertical farm called Farm One that supplies Michelin star restaurants. And in Manhattan, this expensive, crazy city, uh, the world's Manhattan's first vertical farm was designed and, and consulted on by us. We also built our own sort of we work of ag tech where people could rent desk space in our office. And we incubated about four different companies and had 2,500 people come through our office space to learn about different topics in urban agriculture. We also worked on a hardware accelerator. And finally, more recently, uh, another milestone we're proud of is we launched the world's first farm planning software. And I'll actually demonstrate that for you later today. Here's our global impact. Again, uh, pretty spread across the world. Some regions like Latin America and Africa, we haven't had a lot of penetration yet. We can answer questions about why, but this is where we're seeing the biggest demand for our services and where we're executing them. So just very quickly, because we, you know, you should already have a, some understanding of the challenges and some of the opportunities in agriculture and the challenges we're facing. But here's just a quick overview of some that matter to me. 
Uh, we need to produce more food. You know, we do produce enough food to feed everyone, but it's not distributed properly. And with the increases in population and some of the other pressures, we, we do need to find ways to grow more food to meet demand. And also that demand is changing. Uh, consumers, especially as middle classes rise up and, and people increase in wealth or move from rural areas to cities, they're demanding higher quality products. So, so the way that agriculture has been producing outdoors, in some cases with pesticides, in some cases with, with lower quality, you know, that's not really fitting well for a lot of consumers now. And that's an opportunity uh, for people interested in developing these kinds of farms where they can produce higher quality product. We also have some social issues in certain markets related to food and agriculture, communities that uh, rightfully so feel like they've been left behind and, and excluded from healthier eating, healthier living, uh, basically greener environments. So there's also opportunities to, to use agriculture to bridge some of these divides. Of course, our, our, our probably our biggest one is, is just climate change and the shocks in the system. Microclimates where specialized climates grow certain crops are a threat, so we may lose uh, whatever, chocolate, we may lose certain wines, we may lose hops, which is something we're working on here in the Czech Republic. Um, but, but even broader than that, all of the systems are sort of in flux right now, and it's hard to predict what's going to happen. And that's a critical part of, of agriculture to, to continue as it, as it is. We also have different challenges and opportunities related to cities and people's interest in, in being near green spaces. This is something that matters a lot to me. But biophilia, integrating agriculture to cities, certain cities are incentivizing urban agriculture pretty much solely based on this aspect, uh, reducing heat island effect, increasing biodiversity, increasing green, green spaces. We also have the challenge and opportunity of, of farmers uh, aging out. I mean, Australia, it's 56. In the US, I think it's over 60. Europe as well. So we, we see that generations of, of agriculture not being very profitable have, have really led to the farmers having their kids sort of move to the city and evolve beyond agriculture. So there's a lot of challenges facing sort of this transition from the older generation. So who's gonna take care of these farms? Are they gonna be run properly? Are they gonna exist in the same way? You know, what's gonna to happen to that land and, and where's the skills and, and the labor to take care of that? Going much deeper into climate change and agriculture, you can investigate individually some of these challenges that also affect agriculture. I'm not gonna get into all of them, but again, I'm trying to stimulate some of your research nodes that you could get into as you dive deeper into the space. The reason is, you know, whenever you're planning an urban farm, which is something I'll emphasize a lot on this, it's about the context. It's about like where it's located. What is the problem there that you're trying to solve and how are you matching different technologies and business models to solve that problem? And again, any successful business or even nonprofit um, any successful venture has to have a very specific problem that it's targeting. And, and, and these are just some possible problems in agriculture related to climate change that you can go further in and, and build businesses around. Overall, you know, we think that, that urbanization, the, the rapid increase of people moving to the cities, we know 80% of our food is consumed in cities already, as well as climate change that's threatening the sort of import capability of traditional agriculture is gonna really create new ways for us to produce our food and already has. So we can actually have a bit of a, a question here. So these are three different urban farms that are real. Well, you know, one is in Montreal, it's a rooftop greenhouse. This one in Paris is a rooftop outdoor, um, you know, soil-based farm essentially. And this one in Kyoto is an indoor automated vertical farm. So we can ask the question again, you know, which of these farms is best? I don't know if anybody wants to put something in the chat, you know, which one is the better one? Which one is the, the most successful? Which one is the whatever most efficient? You know, if anybody wants to, 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 to share their opinion, um, it's great. It's great to have that. Um, but essentially, you know, it's not exactly the right question, to be honest, because there is no one size fits all. And actually, each of these has certain impacts that are unique to their context and why they're designed the way they are and why they may or may not be successful. So what's happening, sorry, I was just checking the questions a little bit there, so keep them coming in. So for example, in Montreal, this is Lufa Farms and you know Montreal and Quebec has an abundance of renewable energy. They also have a very extreme winter. So you know, growing indoors and using renewable energy actually can be quite a sustainable solution. This company decided to take large warehouses and put greenhouses on top of it. And I believe they have the world's largest rooftop greenhouse with their newest project. I think they have four locations now, 
But again, they're making a specific impact in that market. And what I really like about their business model is that they produce some of the food and then they actually buy food from other farms and package it into bags for their customers so they get more of the value. In Paris, Sula Fraise is doing rooftops with soil. And in this case, they're not doing indoor year-round production in a greenhouse or a vertical farm. They're sort of allowing the elements to interact with the farm, not protecting it. Why would they, why would they do that? Well, in Paris, you know, there's there's a lot of reasons why they would do that. I mean, one is there's a, there's a strong consumer reticence towards these tech-enabled farms that they see as unnatural. So sometimes you may lose customers if you use too much tech in France or in, in Paris in general. Another reason is that the city is incentivizing rooftop farms in particular that can reduce the heat when extreme heat waves like what's happening now in Europe occur. These green spaces on rooftops can help maintain a reduced temperature which has a benefit to energy efficiency and reduces the risk of death due to heat stroke for especially older and more vulnerable populations. So again, it's designed around that, producing a premium, natural, beautiful product, and also meeting the city's needs and requirements there. Okay, and I see a lot of answers on Kyoto, so let's get into that. So, you know, in Japan, you know, there, there, there was a renaissance for vertical farms uh, you know, back in the 80s, and there was actually a lot of them built. Some of them succeeded, some of them didn't. One of the main reasons why it was stimulated was because Japan said you can't encroach on any more uh, forest land. So typically, in many places, forests are cut down for agriculture. If you can't cut down the forests anymore, you have to grow more with less space. And so the idea here was let's grow some of the crops that could, that you know take up space outside, and let's put them indoors, grow them closer to the consumer. Another driver from the consumer side, not from the policy side, like the forest example, is that there were a lot of concerns about contamination in the soil related to radiation. Japan has a lot of nuclear power, has a history of concern about this. So the idea is that growing in these hydroponic indoor farms would allow for um, you know, clean product. So the point is, where are you? What's the driver? What's the, the justification for a greenhouse or a vertical farm? There is none of these that's better than the other. In fact, they are specifically intentionally designed for their market. And that is how you can be successful in the sector, is not getting lost in the one you like the most, but focusing on the best business case. So if we take a step back from some of those possibilities, we can look at a, a simple spectrum of urban agriculture. These are all different typical types of urban farms that we see in major metropolitan, metropolitan areas now, some more than others. But for example, you have typical on the ground soil-based farms. These are gardens, community gardens, school gardens. You can put urban farms on rooftops now and maximize the unused space there, but that requires more money. And sometimes you have to engineer that soil to make it lighter, prepare the rooftop, very various challenges and opportunities there. Uh, this one is Brooklyn Grange, which, which is quite a successful rooftop urban farming company in New York. You can have greenhouses on the ground where you can get year-round production, but in the city, it can be difficult to find space on the ground. But in some places uh, like Detroit, where there's distressed uh, economy and there's a lot of vacant spaces, there's farms being put indoors, but also on vacant lots outdoors. You can on the rooftop, more expensive, but you're not using any valuable space in the city. And then you can, just completely eliminate the sun, go towards with vertical farms, warehouses, opportunity that you can investigate. So these are all different. They all have different costs. They all have different problems they solve. But the ones in the green box are what we call controlled environment agriculture technically. This is greenhouses and vertical farms and also container farms, basically vertical farms in containers. These are the ones that reduce pesticide use, I mean, other urban farms tend to not use pesticides, but outdoor farms do. Uh, they save a lot of water because they have recirculating systems in many cases. Uh, they also can produce year round. So as you control the climate, depending on the level of technology you use for these, these methods, but especially for vertical farms, you can grow year round. Okay, so that's a benefit for food security, resilience, providing the urban population with what they want when they want. And these tend to produce higher quality product because they're controlled. And that also can you know, respond to some demand that we talked about earlier. Now, when you're thinking as an entrepreneur about what kind of business you want to start, what kind of farm you want to start, it's important, again, to not only target the problem you want to solve, but also think about the impact you want to make. When you're doing your research and preparing, 
you can use my framework for assessing impact of urban farms, whether it's an idea for an urban farm you have, or whether it's one you're looking at to analyze and, and research. So we can, of course, look at the triple bottom line of social, economic, and environmental impact. These are described here on the slide of, of some ways to ask that, and we can rate them how well they do that. Typically, it's difficult to achieve, you know, let's say, five out of five or 10 out of 10 ratings for each of these. Typically, you could almost think about it as you have 10 points overall, and, and you have to sort of combine them to achieve that. So I think like one of the problems I face a lot with clients is, yeah, I want to create tons of jobs. I want to make a lot of money. I want to be completely sustainable. You know, it's like this laundry list of wishes. In fact, there are trade-offs, and that's where design comes in. And that's why focusing on the problem and the impact you want to make is, is very, very important in early stages. Now, in addition to those three, you can actually look at three, three other ones. We talked about aesthetics. We talked about cities that are encouraging green spaces, but we also know that this improves health and well-being, can inspire others. You could also look at health as a driver for the impact. Urban farms can improve the quality of the food, which can improve health outcomes, but it could also create activity. We see some urban farms combined with senior living, for example, and we certainly are going to have a much larger aging population in the future. So there may be business opportunities there. Some farms are just focused on uh, education. You know, they're focused on creating research or they're focused on, on doing training. So there's, there's ways to make impact. There's ways to solve problems, again, connected to that, and make money off any of these impacts. You just have to really think about what's happening in your market and, and how, do, how do the numbers add up. So when we go back to that spectrum, right, this is the spectrum oh, here, right? I've basically taken the spectrum and put it out on a chart and then taken the impact categories here to just say, typically, in my opinion, these are the, the ones that have the social, economic, impact, et cetera. And so I want you to think critically about that, right? Why, why do we see that, you know, economic benefits are higher on the controlled environment, sort of high tech side? Because year round production means that you can have year round customers and that business case and those contracts are stronger. You have year round labor, you have a year round investment, um, an investment where you're going to get year round cash flow returned from it, which has certain appeals. So, you know, it's that's one reason why you see the economic case for those a bit stronger than some of the other types of farms. Now you can make money with soil-based urban farms, but again, it's typically seasonal. Um, but there's another interesting angle, right? So from an educational perspective, we see that low-tech farms tend to have more of an advantage and you can actually make money off workshops, trainings, et cetera. That can happen with greenhouse and vertical farms, but happens less commonly. You may wanna ask yourself why, why does that happen less? Well, the short answer is, that you know, the, the outdoor farms are more open to the public generally, and indoor farms are more closed to protect the plants from the public because the plants can get contaminated by pests. And in the case of indoor farms, many times that can come from workers or visitors versus outdoors where it's sort of part of an ecosystem that's balancing itself. While in a controlled environment, although it's more controlled, the risk of a pest outbreak is, and the consequences of that can be much higher. I hope that's clear. I can answer questions about that later. But you can also think about, you know, environmental impact. You know, high-tech farms use a lot of energy. So if you want to really have a low impact in you know, environmentally friendly farm, you may want to look at soil, something that sequesters carbon, manages water in different ways, contributes to biodiversity directly. So, you know, what matters to you? Ask yourself that question. Maybe answer here. Which of these six is most important to you, the impact you want to make the most? Do you want to make the most money? Do you want to have the biggest environmental positive environmental impact? Do you want to transform health, society, the way our cities look? Think about what matters to you because as you plan a business, urban agriculture, you have to run that business and you need to remember why you started and what your reason is. Here's just another quick way to look at environmental impact, which is one of the impact categories and sort of take a city and say, okay, what methods have some environmental impacts that I can at least guide my research to think about what my impact would be, right? So if I build a rooftop greenhouse, I can actually create some insulation for my building. Same thing with a rooftop soil-based farm that can reduce energy or heat island. Um, soil-based farms and greenhouses on rooftops can also manage stormwater. Some cities give you money for slowing down stormwater as, as they need to respond to that and cities flood in, uh, more often. Outdoor, you know, soil-based farms or rooftop soil-based farms can contribute to biodiversity, urban heat island effect reduction. They can be part of a circular economy and organic waste stream. And those are all sort of, again, there's greenhouses there, but most of those are the lower tech 
soil-based solutions. And, and those are pretty compelling environmental impacts and something we need more of in cities. So, you know, definitely want more soil-based urban agriculture in addition to the other methods. You know, this basement one is a vertical farm in a basement to emphasize that vertical farms can, you know, make use of unused spaces. And, and so you can say, what's the environmental impact there? Well, well, if you make an investment in, in a space and it's not being used, that's also an impact on, on, on the energy you put into building that. You want to get some output out of it. So vertical farms can present interesting ways to repurpose unused spaces. We've seen them built in basements. We're seeing them built in caves. We've seen like old subway tunnels, bomb shelters. There's a lot of creativity with where the vertical farms uh, are going. Now, vertical farms and greenhouses can use a lot less water, vertical farms especially, because they're more controlled. So you've got, you know, some argue 90% less water use in outdoor agriculture. And because these farms, all of these urban farms are closer to the consumer, you do have less food miles in the carbon footprint and waste associated with those food miles. Okay, so that's a lot of information. Uh, but again, I want you to think strategically about urban farms. Don't just get your heart attached to one type, but be smart about it. Think about it. Judge them across these impact categories and, and become smarter um, in, in knowing what's happening. Also, when you see the news, when you see what a project is being announced, a vertical farm or greenhouse or one fails, you can ask yourself this question, what went wrong? And, and maybe some of the priorities that were set at the beginning were, were off. So I already talked about controlled environmental agriculture a little bit, but here's just some more details. Um, greenhouses on the left, vertical farms on the right. Main value propositions of this are, you know, and, and, and basically all the kind of technologies that, that you're trying to control in this. Basically the idea of control is sort of illustrated here with the things that we actually control in vertical farms and greenhouses. And so it's really about reducing pests, managing water, optimizing nutrients, giving the plants the CO2 they need to grow faster. I mean, it's really cool just how much tech is in CEA. And as you sort of get that right and, and get the right set points, you can produce incredible product consistently and, and in many cases uh, compete on the market more effectively. These are the advantages. I don't want to get into this too much because hopefully you know some of this, but it's about saving water again. Why? Because we're recirculating the water local production. Again, why? Because we don't need certain types of land. We can actually put these farms almost anywhere. Resilience. Why? Because if there's a storm or if there's a shock in the system, we have some resilience to that storm. And if there's a shock in the system from a market's perspective, we have local production. Uh, they, they avoid spraying pesticides. They can produce year-round. That, that creates consistency in the product. And in many cases, they can have higher yields. So those are some of the interesting, interesting options. So I see a lot of people in the chat. I'll be checking those sometimes, but please use the Q&A feature to ask questions as we get in the Q&A section. That's where I'll start. Okay, so differences between greenhouses and vertical farms. Greenhouses have the advantage of, you know, it's a more established industry, right? It's not as new. So there's a lot more clarity, I think, on the cost. There's a lot more proven examples. It's overall lower risk. But, you know, you need to have um, a lot of space because you only have single layer of production in the winter time or in the hot summer time. You're going to have higher OPEX to either heat or cool, depending where you are in the world. And, um, you know, at the lower scales, they can be less efficient from a labor's perspective. A smaller vertical farm can be more efficient than a small greenhouse. But as greenhouses get bigger, uh, the automation technology is really impressive for how it can reduce labor and optimize. That's like literally farms is, is an example of a quite an automated greenhouse. Vertical farms have the maximum density of production. You can just keep stacking. You can fill spaces. Um, you know, a lot of control because you, you know you don't even have sunlight. So you're controlling every single factor. You know everything the plant is getting, and again, ultra local production. You can go even closer to the customer in some markets. You can have these placed next to distribution centers, but also mostly this point relates to like urban areas where you would never be able to build a greenhouse. But again, high capex, high opex, that energy, uh, all that technology, if it's powered by non-renewable sources, it's going to have a very high carbon footprint and not necessarily be more sustainable. So definitely crunch your numbers there because you know a lot of vertical farms say they're sustainable, but they're actually emitting more carbon uh, from their production than their field-grown counterparts in many cases. Many different ways to do CEA. That's what I want to inspire you because, but again, it always goes back to solving a specific problem. Uh, which ones do I want to talk about here? I mean, some of these like in-farm and app harvest and, um, you know, are, are not succeeding right now. They're, they're, they're going through some financial difficulties. So we can talk about why later on. I guess one I want to highlight is here is NGS in Almira, Spain. This weird plant in this picture here is actually dragon fruit. And this story of this farmer is interesting. It's a 40 acres of olive production. 
And they worked with NGS, NGS, which is a greenhouse producer out of Spain, one of Agritecture's partners. And they said, you know, we want to grow something on our site. We want to do some year-round production, but we want to grow something, you know, new. And, you know, can you do dragon fruit? And so they proceeded to do research and built this greenhouse. It's about 8,000 square meters, multiple greenhouses, just growing this dragon fruit. And again, like the value proposition I mentioned earlier for controlled environment and agriculture, uh, these can grow faster in this greenhouse. They have less labor than outdoors. And again, it's like it's it's year-round production. So you know the, the harvest times are only one time a year, but again, they're always growing, always benefiting, always maximizing output. So now this farmer doesn't just wait for when his olives can be bought once a year, but he actually has another product to add to the market, which is dragon fruit that has a high margin and he's designed a farm that grows it year round, has some automation around irrigation and ventilation and really doesn't take that much labor from the farmer, as he said. The payback for that greenhouse um, is estimated to be two years. So a pretty reasonable investment for the, um, the, the landowner, for the farmer themselves. Another example for vertical farming that could be interesting is the Oshi example. This company seems to be doing pretty well. They raised another $50 million. What they did is they did research for years, found this specialty strawberry in Japan, um, owned that variety of strawberry and started producing into vertical farm in New Jersey and created this luxurious strawberry product. I think it's $8 a strawberry. Maybe the price went down to $5. But yeah, that's a very expensive product. This is an example of sort of the Tesla approach. Go for a premium product, premium customer base first, prove the technology, and then start to move down the market. Now, Oshi has seen enough success with that higher end market that they've convinced investors to develop a, uh, a lower cost, or more, I guess, a, a strawberry for the average person. I don't know. But that's sort of what they're saying is that now there's going to be a lower cost solution on that. We haven't, we haven't seen it yet, but, uh, but they are expanding their operations. Other things you can do, you know, there's, there's certain projects around medicinal plants, there's insects, there's mushrooms like Smallhold. All of these companies are worth looking at, and I can answer questions about different models, but let's, let's continue. So this next section is a bit more about actually planning your, um, your CEA business, your controlled environment agriculture business. Again, some of this applies, actually this does apply to also planning other types of urban farms. Um, but maybe the emphasis is more on CEA because that's really popular now. And there's there's certain reasons why that we already mentioned, year-round production, higher quality, you know, climate change issues that would threaten your farm. So, you know, these are really the main steps. Again, I talked about this like a lot is divide your objectives and then you can draft out your concept related to those objectives. What is the solution? What does it look like high level? Two, understanding your market and choosing your crops. So based on the concept, let's say I sort of said my objectives are to, um, to maximize unused spaces in, um, yeah, in, in New York City by building small farms on the rooftops. Okay, and, and my objective really is I wanna get some money from the infrastructure grants from the city and I wanna produce food for a premium customer. I can draft out what those look like. You know, I can draft out how big my farm is, look at some rooftops in New York and sort of draft out the concept and my goals. Then I can go to the market and I can say, okay, what are people paying for these products? And so I can move backwards and start to think how much of those product can I grow? And again, what can I sell it for to return on my investment? Three is really about choosing the, the technologies to, to do that. So once we know what the market wants to grow, we want to think, okay, what is the right approach to do that? Maybe in this process, we really see that like the demand for basil in the winter is actually really the biggest opportunity that we see from the market research. So in that case, our soil-based rooftop farm won't produce that. So we need to review our, our concept and go back and say, okay, the market's telling us that we need something year round. Instead, let's change our idea to be rooftop greenhouses so we can grow year round or basement vertical farms, you know, also using unused spaces, but still responding to the market in a better way than the previous example. Now you need to sort of do a lot of research to build out your economic model and, and first you need to get your inputs and outputs. So what's the seed going in, the nutrients? It's a lot of work. Farming has a lot of different components to it. Actually, farm planning is something that is, is people struggle with, which is why I'm happy to share this with you and share some tools that we've developed to assist. Um, you need to build a, a financial model and estimate when you're going to get the money back for your facility and your greenhouse, in this case, that we're, we're designing as a first one. And of course, you need to um, iterate through that model, right? So again, challenge your assumptions before you build your farm. You know, okay, is greenhouse better than vertical farm? You know, 
what can I do to optimize this? What can I do to make it better? Review your financial model, be aggressive about it. Because once you start building that, once you start spending investor money or your own money, it's very difficult and, and things get a lot more challenging. So you need to stick to your plan. Um, and this again can be something you go through over and over again as you expand facilities and make decisions. So the market research is so important because you know it, it, it tells you what you're gonna grow, right? Who's gonna buy it? It guides the farm design, the technology you're gonna use to produce that product. In this case, the basil example. It, it also helps to define the distribution strategy. Who is my customer? Where do they buy? Is it directly to them? Is it to the restaurants they eat at or is it to the retailers? Or is it delivered to their door? And it also helps to understand, again, the pricing for those products, which is a key piece of how we're going to make money. So when you're thinking about planning your farming business, your urban farming business, you need to sort of make some key decisions. Um, and again, I don't always, I don't always think about just urban as in like downtown. Think about urban as the whole city and even the edges of the city. So there are some areas where you can build bigger farms or some space. All of those farms that we listed on that spectrum are possible. Um, and they can be in the city, less popular parts of the city, or even just on the outskirts of the city. But either way, typically you have to make a decision about, are you going to sell wholesale or retail? Now, wholesale is really when you're selling it in, in a larger volume to a distributor or to a grocer. And, you know, they're sort of white labeling it. It's Henry's farm, but when you see the packaging, it's going to be Walmart's farms or whatever. And, you know, they do more of the work but they take more of your margin for that. So for example, they sometimes will come pick up the product, but if my basil is selling for $3.50, I may only get a dollar of that and the rest will go to the whole, the distributor or the, the, the retailer and or the retailer. Um, now for retail, you can actually go directly to the consumers themselves. So you can say, pick up your pro, your, your the basil from my greenhouse. I've got a little lobby and like there's a little market stand and you can pick up the basil from there. Or I will deliver it to your, your house for a fee. You know, those are some of the models to get directly to the consumer. The challenge there is you have to spend more time on sales and marketing and actually outreach to customers versus the first option. But the, the good news is that you get more of your margin. I mean, all of, if you sell for 350, you get all of that 350. Maybe you pay some fees for some delivery folks. You've got a lot of other costs. So that decision is a very key one in the early stages of your business planning. <clears throat> so here's an example uh, for basil. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> so you know, if I'm selling wholesale, I may make five to fifteen dollars um, for wholesale. But if I'm selling retail, I make twenty to eighty dollars per pound for retail in, in in New York City. New York City's got a very uh, you know lots of premium customers. And you know, I want to build a profile for my product as well as I'm going through this process. And this is an example of what a profile for my product will look like and allowing me to, to provide more information to build this up. And this is sort of an archive of uh, crop data that you can utilize to plan your business and optimize it. So this is just an example of what you would look at as you're considering crops and building your archive of crops. Now, when you think about the market size, it's not just about how you're gonna sell to the customer and deliver, distribute to them, but it's also about like how many of those are there, right? So in the market research stage, you need to do something of a, a, a bottom up market sizing example. And these are not real numbers, but this is basically how it works. So let's say, you know, a, a grocery store customer will, will be sourcing $2,000 of herbs per week, meaning the, the store itself every week, they need $2,000 of herbs that they want to sell to their customers. So we think 30% of that total, um, you know, herbs could be our basil, okay? And so we think that we there's $660 per week that we can earn. So there's 24 stores like this across Seattle. Um, and so that means we can make about $16,000 per week. And that makes our total addressable size, okay? About $8 million. And that gives us some idea. It's like, it's an okay market size, but it's not that big. And it also guides us that our first farm might not be that big in the end. So it means that, okay, we're mostly focusing on a premium customer, a, a, a select set of stores. So that's really going to guide the size of the farm, the technology I use, the location of the farm, you know, how I'm going to get the product to the customer. So this is a really good exercise to gut check how many people can I sell to and how realistic is this business. And again, this is not just anybody buying these products. You should be thinking about your specific customer. In our case, it was more of the premium customer that we were thinking about for our basil. And just a just a note here that like, you know, it's easy to say, 
oh, we're going to disrupt conventional agriculture by growing food indoors or closer to cities. It's much harder to actually do that. There's huge, 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 huge scale that outdoor agriculture has that urban agriculture cannot um, replace. So the systems actually complement each other. So when you're thinking about planning your business, you know, don't think so much as uh, always just out competing other farms, but think more about like creating a new product and a new experience for the customer to attract them to buy from you over time. And, and you know, that's a better way to look at it is what's your unique value proposition versus try to just to be big and, and be present and sort of a, a build it and they will come attitude. Uh, just another reminder that if you want to do like retail, um, selling is just really, really, it's a lot of work. Some people aren't made for it. Some people aren't. But a lot of our clients that focus on restaurants and direct to consumer uh, sort of retail distribution model and pricing and sales model, you know, they, they spend a lot more time talking to chefs and, you know, meeting with restaurants and going around talking to customers, because again, you know, they are getting all of the, the, the revenue from the sale of the product, but they have to do all the work. So you have to really ask yourself, especially in the early days, most of the time the CEO of the business, you know, for a small vertical farm or a small urban greenhouse or urban farm, they're the salesperson. The other person has to go around and convince people why our basil is the best basil on earth and, and why you as a restaurant need to be serving it to your customers as part of your, uh, you know, Genovese salads and your uh, bruschettas and whatever it is you have with basil on your pestos and your, your basil drinks, whatever it is, you know, you want to convince them. So you need to ask yourself the question, you know, are you going to uh, be the salesperson or how are you going to find an excellent salesperson? This is a critical, critical person for your team in urban agriculture. I talked a little bit about sort of sales strategies, but let's talk about distribution briefly here. The typical model is the farm and then hundreds of thousands of miles to distributor. And then it goes from the distributor to the stores. And that's like the typical model that's relatively efficient in some ways uh, and certainly established. Here are some new models that you can consider. <clears throat> you could actually have the farm at the store, smaller versions of your farm or even larger ones connected to it. You could have a farm in the city and that farm can supply stores or it could supply direct to consumers, farmers markets, et cetera. You could have a farm on the outside of the city where maybe you get the benefits of being close to the city, the consumers, but you're spending less money on real estate. Maybe you don't get as much, as much community engagement. And certainly, you know, there's going to be other challenges with being away from the city, but there's benefits of, of scale if you want to build something big and you can supply stores in that city or even supply even other uh, towns and cities. Going to skip this one because we talked about market sizing. Okay, so there's a lot more. Like honestly, our urban farming classes. Some of these slides are from that. It's seven different courses. It takes, um, I think it's like six hours if you do all the homework assignments. Um, but if you take all the class things, like maybe two and a half hours of lessons. But really targeted on technologies, economics, etc. There's some things like this that sort of guide you on you know, your steps about where you should be selling to. This is going to tell us, you know, should I be selling to farmers markets, online, restaurants, CSA, and some of the questions you would need to answer. There's a lot more on that. Just some reminder that, you know, if you're judging your own business model and your business plan before you send it to investors, or you're maybe looking at another one, these are some of the metrics that we really think matter a lot. Uh, CapEx per density, you know, especially for indoor farms, but all farms, how much are you spending to get how many plants? That's like reducing that CapEx, the minimum is going to help you increase your return on investment. But if you reduce it too low, you may not have the technologies, automated irrigation, automated harvesting, whatever, to, to get the job done right. So there's a trade-off there that you have to look at. But it's a good assessment of, you know, uh, of the business's performance or the, the overall business relative to others out there that may have higher CapEx. Build time, you know, some of these projects take a long time to build. And if you don't estimate that in your business plan, you will not be prepared. Your investors will not be prepared. And it, it gets easier after you build your first farm, but building these farms can be a challenge. Energy efficiency, grams per kilowatt hour, speed of tech evolution, you know, how quickly is this tech evolving and can you keep up? And then unit costs, very, very important in business. You know, if you're if you're selling your product for 350, how much did it cost to produce that product? And what's your What's your unit cost? You can understand the margin. Okay, so this is just some other thoughts for you. For those of you who haven't produced business plans, I thought I would include this. This is just a very simple five parts of the business plan you would want to consider. And you can bring in a lot of the information you've gathered from the market research, from the distribution model, et cetera, and other things you'll learn um, to, into, into a business plan like this. And you know this can be a living document. 
uh, both for investors and you. Here's the other five steps as well that go through how you're going to market your product, manage the team, operate the farm, et cetera. Let's get into some tools and resources as we wrap up this presentation and then we can open it up to Q&A. Um, so you can actually plan these businesses, greenhouses, vertical farms, or containers online using agriculture designer software. So this entire methodology I described of the steps to plan the farm, the ones I did in the original workshops, the ones we've executed for consulting clients, is available on our software with a variety of tools that help you achieve the, the basically build your business plan for any greenhouse, uh, vertical farm, or container farm. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, soil-based urban farms on here yet. We hope to in the future, but we're seeing most of the demand in CEA. So we have a couple of features on there, including you know learning uh, about the the sector. I mentioned the classes already and some research resources there. And you know this is going to be very important to you because right now more than ever there's opportunities in CEA. As I mentioned, the climate change drivers, the changes in agriculture, but there's also a lot of difficulties. There's been multiple failures. 2022 was a terrible year for vertical farming. And this year has also been really bad. So you, know, you need to be smart. You need to look at the numbers. You need to plan properly. So we begin in the software with our online classes. There you go. It's about five hours of classes. And it's from different team members, again, covering different topics like uh, what, what is lighting for indoor farming? How does it work? Or what is climate control? How does that work? Uh, different business models, sales models, et cetera. And you can see there's some downloadable resources to have you plan your business there. Now, step two is really like, <clears throat> I mean, basically there's steps within the software that are very clear when you log in there. What we did here is wanted to give you a challenge with the software so that you can use it. So when you sign up the software, you get a seven day free trial. You can test the classes and you can test some of the features. But one of the things you can do in the software is you can model out different farms. So I just sort of wanted to create a homework assignment for you uh, is that you can think about which of these farms you might wanna develop and maybe start to think about the farm type, the location, et cetera. Just try to think about these, con basically these are concepts for you to begin with that you can look at in the software and build a model for. That's what I'm trying to say to be more clear. And this is like what it looks like when you build the model. You fill in a form and you get an economic snapshot of the economics of that farm. So we, we can do it together. We can pick a high tech uh, farm in Dubai as one example and do a quick estimate in, in a moment. The modeling tool looks like this. You select your project location. Uh, if it's a greenhouse, it's going to bring in the weather data and climate data automatically, which is really cool. You can choose how big your farm is going to be. So again, if you have a specific site, rooftop, basement, outdoor land, you can choose that. And then again, this is the only place online that you can get the yield estimates for all of the most popular crops for greenhouses, vertical farms, and container farms, including mushrooms now that are recently added, but also microgreens and, and fruits and vegetables. And you can put the crop in and then choose your, your method. This is NFT as a nutrient film technique, which is a hydroponic method, not NFT like non-fungible token. Um, and you can choose your farm, you know, like is your farm gonna have a variety of crops, one crop, et cetera. You could override the inputs around energy uh, costs or water costs or, or labor. And you can basically get a snapshot like this, right? So you, you get an economic model snapshot and you can you know, manipulate it and adapt it. We also have partners. So once your plan is done, you can actually send your business plan to funders in the United States, financing partners, or you can send it to vetted partners that can help you build the farm. The lighting company, the greenhouse company, control companies, the racking companies. These are some of our 30 plus partners that we have. And basically we facilitate introductions to them, get the quotes for you and help the sale go through so that you can get your equipment and build your farm. And they obviously appreciate and respond well to the fact that you've used our software to come up with a business case and that you've uh, reduced risk where possible by doing your market research, et cetera. What I really love about it is that it works. You know, I was in Saudi Arabia earlier this year visiting Batar Farms, and this is a uh, 2,500 square meters of bed space vertical farm in Riyadh. It is the largest vertical farm in Saudi Arabia right now and the first commercial vertical farm in Riyadh. So really proud of this client, which used our software to do their market research. out their farm and then actually contact us for the suppliers to build the farm. In this case, the supplier was uh, iFarm. And so it was really cool to see this family owned business um, save tons of money um, on planning their farm and, and really find a great supplier with our solutions. So 
that is the end of my presentation. What I'm going to do for you really quickly right now is I'm just going to demonstrate the software here um, so that we can get started on um, questions, okay? Because I think it'll really help you understand it. But uh, for now, thank you for paying attention to this presentation. I hope you gained a lot of insights from it. And just give me one second while I quickly demonstrate the software for you. So here we go. Um, is it okay? It, it won't take long. This is the last part. We're good? I see you join the video again. Okay. So again, this is the world's first farm planning software. If you go back to my origin story, like I couldn't get the information that I wanted to know about urban farming and about greenhouses and vertical farming, forget about it. So we did the work for you. We've taken all of our knowledge and we've basically created a platform where you can learn the best practices by taking the classes. You can do your market research on the platform and choose your crops. You can even think about like your brand and your business and the impact you wanna make. We talked about that a little bit. You can model out your farm. And you can actually, again, think about choosing your right site and looking for equipment and financing all within the platform. So the steps of sort of planning a business are in here. So I, I'm not going to show you the classes. You guys get that idea. But I'm just going to show you how easy it is to come up with a, a quick uh, concept. Oh, no. Let me go back. So this is what it looks like. I'm going to say Henry's cool farm. Okay, I'm going to pick Dubai as my location. Let's try and do this like premium um, salad mix farm in Dubai. And again, like let's assume we did market research. We're going to use some fake numbers now, but let's let, let's assume we did the market research first just to make it easier. My vertical farm, you know, labor costs in Dubai are not that high. So my vertical farm is actually going to be, um, yeah, medium in automation, I think is what I'm going to choose. You can change your currencies. You can change like to meters if you want that. You can choose ownership over the site. Let's say my vertical farm is going to be, uh, yeah, maybe let's do a 3,000 square meter one. Ceiling height is going to help us understand, you know, how tall the, the ceiling of, of the building is so that I can, you know, have the three-dimensional space to design. I can choose what I want to include in my farm for various aspects of it. This is what I showed you. These are all the crops you can choose from. And then for each crop, I'm actually allowed to, um, you know, choose basically the method. So we've actually done the yield numbers, the estimates for this. So this one was going to be baby greens and aeroponic was the sort of challenge I gave you all or one of those three concepts. There's little guidelines that guide you as you build this. So you can know and, and also the classes will help you as well. Let's say I want to have five layers. I think that should work there. You can choose the grower experience. Let's say the business is being planned with me and someone who is a good experienced grower. You can adjust the the labor rates, you can choose how it's funded and put those metrics in, and you can override uh, relative parts of the cost. Now, once you've done all of this, you're gonna basically access our database and we're gonna model out what the farm typically would perform like. So, you know, we're selling at a relatively high price, but not crazy high. We've got a very significant CapEx for this vertical farm. I mentioned that they're expensive. But we do seem to have a payback period that's within the realm of reason where there might be a business here to explore further. What you can do is you can look at the breakdown of the business over time. You can see how many people are going to be fed energy, which you could use to calculate carbon footprint. We're adding that feature later on. Yield, water, jobs, et cetera. What's really cool is that you can actually go down with our pro account. You can actually advance things a little bit more. So we see here that our growth system is costing us about $516 uh, per square meter. And maybe we have an opportunity where we have a, we've already found a supplier that actually can do this at $400 per square meter. So what it does is actually updates the model live without you going back to the form. The form. So this advanced mode, you can do this across key parts of the business, as well as looking at what are my biggest costs in this farm in particular. You can do the same thing as you look across OPEX, creating a live planning of your business. You can export some of this data to Excel, and you can also look at a 15-year operating summary and sort of see where in the business waste and revenue and OPEX, et cetera, collide. And that's about it for now, but I just want to show you how quickly and easily you could actually plan these farms. And I hope that today you have gotten some of the key considerations 
for why urban agriculture, different approaches to urban agriculture, how to think about the right urban farm for you, the role of high technologies in achieving that, and how you can plan a better urban farming business. So I hope you enjoyed the masterclass lecture and demonstration, and let's get into some questions. That was awesome. I mean, like, you know, thank you so much for such an amazing lecture. Um, this was really helpful. Let me just remove you from the spotlight and yes. I think the first thing that you can look? probably, I'm sorry, again? Go ahead. Do you want me to look at the questions now or how do you want to do this? No, I would just want you to first have a glass of water. You have to speak <laughs> for now. Do that first. And meanwhile, <laughs> so what true. I do is, meanwhile, I have a poll for people. Uh, let me quickly roll that poll out. And in two minutes, everyone, you can see this poll on your screen. It has three questions. Oh, interesting question. How confident, comfortable, or convincing you are about vertical farms. Okay, everybody, okay, we started to pour in. So we will have it open for two minutes. Uh, meanwhile, you know, we can, if you want, you can look at the Q&A. You can pick yeah, up the I'll questions. Look. What 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 we'll also do is uh, we have people who have raised their hands, and we will also pull them in. They will enable the video, and we'll put them in the spotlight. So anyone who really wants to ask questions to Henry, uh, please raise your hands uh, and be ready with your question. We'll pull you in the spotlight soon. We'll begin with Amol Kumar and Prem Kumar. But before that, I would ask Henry to pick two or three questions from the Q&A first, answer them, and then we will pull uh, the, the live audience. Okay. okay so results are still pouring in. Yeah, meanwhile, yes, Henry, while they're answering, you can pick your question and you can begin. Okay, so I'm gonna start with Daniel Kohler's question first. Do you see a space for smaller niche farms? Otherwise, what is the minimum size for a vertical farm? I think that actually today, if you're planning a vertical farm, most people should be looking at a small niche farm. You know, $7 million, you saw that snapshot, that's not easy to start as your first farm. So you need to start with something smaller. And, and we see certain clients and certain users from our software that are looking at $250,000, $500,000. Now, if you're building a small farm like that, it has to be a niche. You simply can't produce enough to be in many, many different supermarkets. So again, going back to that premium customer, there's some really creative ways to look at this. Farm One, which is one company I mentioned, is, is the best boutique vertical farm in the world. They run workshops, they run tours, they do partnerships with chefs. They, they benefit from the fact that they're urban and boutique and they grow amazing product edible flowers, and the whole tour itself is an experience. So they've increased the value of the product so much more. And I think that that's a really good niche one. There's others that do mushrooms that are more niche focused. There's others, there's one in North Carolina that's growing halophytes. It's basically like a sea asparagus. And they've connected their whole business to restoring uh, ecosystems, a really unique vertical farm that's here on farms. Um, and so, you know, find that unique model. I think there's absolutely a space for it. The minimum, you know, I've seen, you could do a microgreens business, like just a small microgreens vertical farm and sell that and, and definitely make a profit if you run it and sell properly. You know, you can do that in your closet, to be honest. You can do that in a part of your kitchen. Like that's how small it can it can be. But I would say, you know, most boutique vertical farms I see are around a thousand square feet, let's say hundred square meters, approximately to 300 square meters, 3000 square feet as sort of a, a minimum commercially viable farm. And you can model those farms to a, a, a very good level of detail in our software, just to nudge you there again, if you're serious about seeing what works. Okay, you wanna make another one? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Du, 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 du. Can the quality standards of hydroponics, this is from Darshana Patra, thank you for your question. Can the quality standards of hydroponics match with that of crop raised from a field? Difficult question to answer, but I'm going to go for it. So, you know, there's many different types of outdoor farms. So it's hard to say, you know, is it good or not? You can have an outdoor farm that's producing a really high quality that's even close to the city. But let's just talk about typical farms for a certain product. Let's say the product is, again, lettuce. Okay. <laughs> so if lettuce, if I'm buying lettuce in New York, sometimes it's going to come from Arizona or California. It's often sprayed with pesticides. 
and it's often been um, harvested and put in a truck or obviously put in a truck and transported to me. So it's, it's old. As it goes through that journey, it actually loses some of its nutritional value. Now, I'm at the same store and I see a vertical farm product that's lettuce. It's more expensive, but it's closer. You know, that product is going to have a much higher quality of flavor as well as nutrition because it's fresher. Freshness is a key driver for nutrition. And so these kinds of farms do improve the quality. Hydroponics versus, you know, soil is another question. You know, soil does have micronutrients in it that sometimes are difficult to bring into hydroponics. So, you know, there is benefits to soil from a complexity of the nutritional profile that I think generally is healthier. But again, where is that soil-based farm? Where are pesticides sprayed in the product? What are the other factors driving quality, you know, versus a hydroponic farm? So I think the hydroponic farms are able to compete on a nutritional level, nutritional level with soil-based. But if we had to choose, you know, everything should be coming from, I would say, you know, pesticide-free outdoor production. We just can't realistically do that for the human population anymore. Okay, let's see, let's one more. Uh, do, 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 I, that, that taste one was sort of answered again. Control the carbon footprint. Okay, there's a couple of questions about the carbon footprint. So if I have an outdoor farm, you know, my carbon footprint comes from the, the pesticides and fertilizers I'm using, the waste that's being created and the carbon that's emitting from that. But overall, my infrastructure, the embodied energy in that carbon is low, and I'm not really spending any energy or electricity to power that. Greenhouses, I'm using the sun. I do need to power some things. So that's going to start to have some kind of carbon footprint. A lot of greenhouses are powered by gas. Vertical farms are electric. Right? So I have to take less electricity from the grid to power this entire farm where I have no sunlight. So that demand, if that is very significant, because there's layers and layers and layers of lights, and there's climate control throughout that system to keep a consistent temperature. So there's a lot of demand. In addition to that, I have a lot of energy, embodied energy and carbon from the construction of the project that's also much more significant than outdoor agriculture. So if that farm is powered by non-renewable sources, which many, many regions still have non-renewable energy, then the product I have coming out of my farm has to also account for that carbon footprint of the energy that I'm sourcing it from. So that product versus a field product is going to have a higher carbon footprint. And so it's not necessarily saying it's more, it's less sustainable. In some cases, it may make a difference. Um, for example, if you are importing things a really long distance, there's a lot of waste. If you have, if you want to consider resilience, but from a pure carbon perspective, unless the vertical farm is powered by renewable energy, it's it's not generally lower carbon in footprint, even with accounting for the reduction in the food miles. Now, every single case is a little bit different, but this is what our analysis finds, and we've done this for some consultations to a certain level of detail, or a lot of detail. <laughs> so. Uh, that's three questions. Do you want more or do you want to stop there? I think we could. We are, we are promoting uh, some people to be panelists so they can ask you questions live. Meanwhile, we have the results of the poll. I'm like, just good news for you because 99% people believe that vertical farms and CEA can solve food problems of the world, which means it's such a believable concept. 99% wow. people have two, two they, 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 people. They didn't answer partially. They said it can solve the problems. Uh, absolutely, 51%, partially 48%, 1% says, uh, which is two people, no, it won't work. So okay. this is good news. Of course, we understand it can't really solve absolutely, but yes, partially, because we do need conventional Yeah, I mean, I think well. partially, is the, partially is the right answer, you guys, you guys because keep in absolutely. mind, like, we've got animals, we've got staple crops. We didn't talk about why you can't grow, like, wheat or corn in vertical farms. So Remember, like we're, we're only solving a piece of the food security challenge here. I want that to be really clear to everyone. Greenhouses can Im Im impact it pretty significantly, but okay, that's good. So absolutely impartially, it's good to see the enth enthusiasm. Okay, wonderful. Uh, pulling in the, the first attendee for the question, Prem Kumar, I mean, like I allowed you to be a panelist. Uh, I am promoting Ria now. I allowed Om Prakash as well. We will pick a couple of questions. So, 
Okay. Guys, do you understand like when you're raising your hand, I'm actually asking you to join and enable your video yes. as a panelist, right? So if you're if you're raising your hand, it means that you are willing. But when I'm allowing you, some of you are declining. So I think the message was, wasn't clear. Alok, you're back. I'm, I'm promoting you as a panelist. Else mm -hmm. we'll pick questions on the Q&A. Next courage for the first one. Yeah, maybe let's give 30 seconds to this. Else we'll move to the Q&A list. Um, so yeah, whenever you're, I can look at the Q&A list if you want. Yeah, please, yeah, meanwhile, go okay. ahead with the Q&A. So, you know, I think like for this question from Govind, can you make it organic? Depending on the region you're in, uh, most regions will not allow hydroponic product to be certified organic because organic certification relates to restoring and, and using soil. But there are some markets, the United States, a certain parts of the Middle East where you can be certified organic. Our software will let you estimate what organic production will do for your economics. So if you're interested in organic, you can look at that. It's certainly possible. The short story is that in my experience, many organic growers who use indoor farming um, struggle, they have lower yields, and they don't always have a market that's going to value their product the same way they value other organic products, so they don't get the additional price uh, value in the market. So it's totally possible if it's something you care about. But again, ask yourself, what is organic and what matters to you? Does restoring the soil matter to you? Then go into soil, okay? But if you're trying to reduce pesticide use and create a cleaner product, you can grow without pesticides and you can market yourself as pesticide free with a greenhouse or a vertical farm. Um, and you don't need to use the organic label. A lot of people don't know that organic doesn't mean pesticide free. It just means they used organic pesticides. That's an important yeah. observation. Yeah. A lot of people are not aware of that. Organic means, I mean, like it's free of everything. It, it isn't. Okay. Yeah, uh, it doctor, doctor, doesn't mean yeah. pesticide free. Yeah, it doesn't mean pesticide free. It's so, uh, you know, but a greenhouse, uh, Many of these don't use pesticides um, okay. at all. Okay, great. We have a first person. Yes, Dr. Dr. Bhushan, uh, we have allowed you. You may not enable your video. You can go ahead and ask the question. Are we audible, Dr. Bhushan? I think he's on mute. You're on mute, sir. Okay. Then... Dr. Bhushan, unmute yourself. No worries. I'm allowing Mr. Prem Kumar as well. I'm allowing Prem, Prem Kumar, uh, you're also allowed. Go ahead, ask a question. Whomsoever wants to ask a question, kindly unmute yourself first, please. Yes. You can, you can enable your video if you want. That's okay. There we go, I'm allowing you as well. I'll pick your question. Yeah, Devika, you will need to unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Okay, in the meantime, oh, there we go. Hi, Devika. Yes. Uh -huh. Sir, uh, I wanted to ask like vertical farming will not, will restrict the natural uh, pollination. So how, like, uh, we know that natural pollination is not there, so there will be a deterioration in quality and uh, nutrition also. Like honeybees uh, do a lot of work. So how will we overcome that? Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, uh, certainly pollination for certain crops uh, can be difficult. Again, many of those crops are grown in greenhouses, not vertical farms. Uh, tomatoes are mostly grown in greenhouses. These fruit and crops are grown in greenhouses. You don't see them in vertical farms as much. That's because they take slower to produce, but you are seeing strawberries in greenhouses more, and we are seeing some experimentation with tomatoes and sort of baby cucumbers in greenhouses. Now you can have uh, vertical farms rather. You can have bees in greenhouses. You can have bees in vertical farms. Um, it's definitely possible. There are certainly challenges with it, but basically we get bees to do the job or you find mechanical uh, pollination strategies or some combination of both. We get your the answer, Devika. Thank you. Yes, yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. And you can look up some of the Dutch, you know, providers that that sell the beehives that people put in greenhouses. There's there's definitely work that's being done there. And in vertical farms, they get confused by the light. It's definitely not as ideal for the bees, I would say. And there is certain amount of um, 
death of the bees that happens. Studying vertical farming is less proven in that regard with pollination, but there's there's people solving that problem. Krupa? Uh, hello, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. Hi. Hi. Uh, sir, uh, so my question was that uh, for a country like India, uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Okay, so my question is that for a country like India, where there is huge population and the land area is very much restricted and uh, there is no uh, enlargement in the land area to uh, enhance agriculture, so how can we implement uh, vertical agriculture to feed the growing populations in India? Like, is it successful to feed such a large population only by using vertical agriculture? Or how can we support the future of India using vertical agriculture? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And India is, is, is an incredibly interesting country to investigate from any agriculture perspective. But, you know, I wouldn't say it goes back to solving the specific problem, right? So in certain parts of India, there are uh, consumers that will pay more for higher quality product. There's not necessarily that many of them, but in the total context, they are there. They want a clean product. They want a better, healthier product for their family. You can build businesses with vertical farming to target those customers and solve their problem. That's not going to feed the entire population, but there's a business there. Um, I think that also from a more low tech perspective, there's a lot of opportunities in India uh, based on the climate in some of its uh, some of its regions, um, but also the fact that there is a little space. So you know. We need to stop thinking about vertical farming just as like warehouses with big vertical farms. Yes, that's the typical way with all that technology, but you can actually reduce that technology and take some of the principles, principles of control. You can control wind, you can control with shading, you can control with, with simple irrigation strategies. You can take aspects of that control from greenhouses and precision agriculture and vertical farming and bring it to your space, whatever it is. Maybe it's an empty lot, Maybe it's the side of a building. Maybe it's a rooftop. We're talking about unused spaces in, in highly populated cities. So, you know, where is the sunlight? Where can you get access to water? Where can you get the basics for what plants need? And then, how can you use hydroponic technologies to grow without the need for soil and grow vertically in some cases, maximize that space? There are many, many, many examples of vertical hydroponics in India um, that you can search for and look at. I think they, they've been actually pioneering a lot of the reduction of cost and integration of these systems. But you know, to feed, let's say, leafy green consumption for all of Indian populations, the most effective way to do that would, to, would be to have incentivize individuals and communities to collaborate on small hydroponic farms on unused spaces and rooftops. That would be probably the, the most efficient way to get the, the maximum impact for that population. Um, there's also other really interesting parts of the system that could be vertical. I think a lot about small hold uh, animal uh, farmers in India. Often they struggle to get the higher quality grass for their animals. There are definitely businesses that are possible to produce the fodder, which requires a lot less energy than producing some of these other crops in vertical systems, simplified systems. And then they can actually distribute that, that product, which helps to improve the health of the animals a lot better. So, you know, that's feeding the Indian population as well and strengthening the wider food system. So what we need to do again is to take the message I'm putting out here is what is the context in your market? Who is the customer? What is the problem? And when we see all these images and videos of vertical farms and high-tech urban farms around the world, we say, oh, that's exciting. Let's do that in India. That's great but you need to adapt it to your context. So I, hopefully these answers have given you some ways to think about where it could fit from a high-tech side, but also that more likely a low-tech solution uh, that's distributed is a better uh, option for India. Just to add to that. Yeah. Uh, yeah please go ahead, Krupa. Uh, no, sir. Uh, please continue, sir. Okay. Just to add to that, Krupa, uh, if you see the ag tech scene in India, I'm mean, like, you know, most of the grocery apps that you would know, like Big Basket, Deep Rooted, and so many others, they all have invested heavily in vertical farming and aquaponics and all of that. In fact, if you understand, India lives in villages and urban cities. So, and urban cities are expanding like ever. So you, and, and these are the people who have that kind of uh, purchasing uh, ability as well to buy those products. And these are not very expensive products, even they come from vertical farms. And that actually is serving, is, is helping them get 
that amazing lettuce or that amazing herbs and other things that they're looking for. So it is already happening big time in India and it is successful. And in a country like India, which is limited by its, I mean, like, you know, land resources and geographical resources, it, it makes all the more sense that we develop vertical farming as an alternative. And even if we are able to maybe take away 10%, 20%, 30% load of the cultural, uh, the traditional, organ, uh, traditional farming practices, that will be a win-win for everybody. So this, is, this has huge, huge, tremendous potential. A lot of work is already happening in India, but we have hardly touched 5% or even less of the true potential that we have in CEA. Uh, this is just going to grow big time. Radhika, you're next. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you both. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, sir, uh, hybrid varieties go well with the uh, vertical farming. Do what? Sir, hybrid varieties go well with the vertical uh, farming. What about hybrid varieties? I mean, most vertical farms are growing, you know, leafy greens and herbs. So yeah, there's some hybrid you know, varieties there. They can work. I mean, you can grow anything in an indoor farm, literally anything. You could grow potato, you could grow an avocado tree, you could grow anything you want. You can, you can grow wheat. The problem is how much time and money does it cost to produce that thing? And can you make money off selling it to recoup that cost? Um, but anyway, yes, you can use hybrid varieties. You can use uh, you can you can use many varieties for for growing indoors. So maybe you're up. Yeah. No thanks. Okay. So you can unmute yourself, please. Sumit, you're not ready. Raghav, go ahead. Yeah. Hello. Yes, Raghav, uh, please. Uh, yeah, so I have this question. Like, uh, there is an aspect of uh, looking at the aspect of crops. So soil-based farming has like a large variety of crops that can be grown, whereas in vertical farming. So how can you overcome that limitation uh, and like overcome the limitation and grow into a successful business? Yeah, so you know, um, I think that over time, the technology costs for vertical farming will go down. And as that goes down, there will be some new varieties or some new crops that you can grow indoors to diversify what you produce. That journey, I think, is actually pretty long. Um, I don't think we're going to be growing wheat commercially or any of these things anytime soon. So, you know, maybe strawberries, that's happening, maybe other berries, specialty products. Uh, there's lots of interesting things being grown in vertical farms already. So Again, the, the way you solve it economically is, who is your customer? How many of them are there? What do they want to buy? How much are they willing to buy it for? How, you know, that's what it starts with, that's the business. So you know, don't worry too much about the variety of the products you can grow. Instead, find out what the market wants to grow and then maybe don't build a vertical farm, maybe build something else, a different kind of farm, a, a greenhouse or soil-based farm, that supplies that if a vertical farm can't do it. So that's that's the answer is like, again, look at the market and, and, and identify the specific product and then match the technology. I'm hearing a lot of questions from people about vertical farming. I get it. I get it's exciting. It's interesting. I get you see the investment, you see the tech, but the question should be more about, I mean, you can ask whatever you want, but your questions yourself should be more about who want, what do people want to buy? You know, what, what, what do people really want to consume? What is, what is, lacking in supply what is lacking in quality and how can i i produce something better that's the business the business itself is farming not vertical farming hello thank you my pleasure good luck Sumit, you're next yeah hi Sumit. Sumit, unmute yourself please Okay, Prabhu, you can I go ahead. Hi, sir. Good evening, sir. Sir, Your my question is uh, uh, Your voice is dropping. 
as my math ma'am thank you my question is uh, there is a misunderstanding that in vertical forming can you hear me ma'am yes yes, yes hello go ahead please am i audible to your so the voice is dropping in our local use for horticultural crops uh, in in locality there is a misunderstanding that uh, agriculture crop only used can we use agriculture crop prabhu we just can't hear you what we suggest is you ask your question in the q and a i'll read out i'll read out yeah. okay meanwhile um i'm just taking uh, this question from dr lipsa bhushan she is saying that can we go 100% organic practically so again you can uh, you first you'd ask yourself like what organic means to you and to your customer if the customer wants organic most of the time that time they don't understand what organic means if you ask 10 people what organic means i think 9 out of 10 of them will say pesticide free so you know you can go organic you can have organic certification as i mentioned earlier but it has a, a, a much higher cost your yields are going to be lower in many cases and you may not get that value in the market so in my opinion focus on local and clean pesticide free these are two things that matter to consumers almost as much as organic and and actually we're seeing the data says that more people are willing to pay more for local or as much as organic so you know i think that Yes, you can be 100% organic. Can you be certified depends on your market? Is it worth it? Probably not. We have a whole class in our commercial urban farming class about aquaponics and organics. So if you're really excited about that kind of production and trying to be more sustainable, you can watch that class and and learn from our experts on that. One of our experts who teaches the class operated what was the largest organic certified vertical farm in the world. Okay, cool. Um uh- Taking a few more questions, I mean, this is more like a futuristic question. Imagine, let's say we have implemented like 80% of the world's food is coming from vertical farms. Do you see that world happening? And if that world is happening, what are the negative impacts that we haven't foreseen yet? So, Kar, I, I want to I get this right. This is fun. So, you're saying a world in the future? Can you repeat it? A world in the future where where percent is all grown by vertical farms? Is that what you're yes. saying? Twenty five percent or much? Eighty eighty percent. Eighty percent of eighty percent is of, grown scaled very much. Of our of our of our leafy green production, for example. Yes, of course, of that. Okay. I mean, I think the primary negative consequence of that is that if it was happening today with today's energy mix, we would be increasing the carbon footprint of leafy green production dramatically in the short term. So we would be, once all those farms are up and running on a consistent basis, we'll be emitting more carbon than we were before to produce this a product that's maybe better uh, to some extent from quality. Again, there's other, there are good consequences, like we'd be using much less water, but the carbon footprint would go high. We're talking about the negative consequences. I think another negative consequence, again, there's different actors in this. A lot of the field agriculture, that the people who work on it are migrant labor, low-cost labor, et cetera. That labor would no longer be part of that product mix. They would no longer be growing the leafy greens. So there would be a certain amount of unemployment in rural areas or from developing countries that come in to harvest the leafy greens during the harvest period that would lose their livelihoods entirely. I think another negative consequence could be um, that the farmers themselves struggle with that transition. So as the transition comes, as they, as they're, 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 let's say the retailers say, we're only buying vertical farm product from now on. So then what do they do with their field? They have to grow something new. They have to learn new skills. They have to adapt. The, the farmers do depend on the demand of consumers, um, and that's why they're growing the product. So when that's gone, so those are, those are three negative consequences uh, to consider. I think that, let me see what other ones there are. I mean, I think, 
yeah, I think those are the main ones. There's some other like maybe weird ones we could talk about, but that's uh, those are the main ones. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, when we talk about vertical farms, you're mostly talking about leafy vegetables or strawberries and stuff like that. Is it possible, this is a question from Vasudev Mate, is it possible that we can grow rice or wheat someday through hydroponic farming or vertical farms? Yeah, so we talked about this a little bit, but let's get into it now. And I, I really, this is important. If you care about vertical farming and you want to be realistic about it, you need to understand this, this point, right? Why we're growing the crops we're growing and not other crops. And, and will we be able to grow those crops? So first of all, technically, you can grow anything in an indoor farm, okay? So completely artificially late, you can grow anything. NASA uh, and other space agencies grow different crops, including rice, including trees, including different fruits, they, potatoes, they grow them to test how they could actually produce food for astronauts or on colonies on Mars or in space. Why? Because it's very expensive to ship things in space. So it's easier to ship the seeds and the nutrients than it is to ship the food entirely. And also having a farm and a spaceship would produce some oxygen. So there's one of our advisors at agriculture, Dr. Jean Giacomelli, led a project which is like a greenhouse that expands like this once it's in space and it produces enough food and also um, oxygen for the astronauts. So really cool stuff. But on Earth, that's very expensive. <laughs> so, you know, like, why is it expensive? Okay, so there's a couple of reasons. <clears throat> a product won't grow well in a vertical farm or perform well in a vertical farm from an economic perspective um, if it has a low harvest index. Harvest index is the percent of the plant that can be consumed, right? So if I'm replacing the sun and creating all the environment to grow an avocado tree, I only get the avocado fruit, but I had to grow all that biomass. That's wasted money, you know? So that's another reason. Um, you know, another, another way you can look at it is, does it grow? So le lettuce is like all edible basically, right? So that's why it fits with vertical farming. Another question is how quickly does it grow? If, if I have a business that's very high in capex, right? So I'm building an $8 million facility. If I fill that facility with avocado trees, I won't get my revenue until year three or four. Investors don't like that. Investors do want cash flow, you know, especially with high infrastructure, high capex businesses. So let leafy greens, every 30 days, I've got a product. So I can actually be selling every single week. Uh, so that is a cash flow that benefits the business and, and sort of helps to de-risk some of these elements of it. Another question you can ask yourself is, does it ship well? If a product stores and ships well, then the problems we've talked about of waste on that supply chain, freshness and nutrient loss in the supply chain, quality loss in the supply chain, et cetera, is less relevant. So, you know, corn, wheat, soy, they store pretty well. So, you know, why do we need to grow them in vertical farms? We don't, we don't have to do that. We can optimize yields and increase wa improve water efficiency in outdoor fields. And that'll be more impactful than growing wheat in vertical farms. The energy, the time, all of that will only increase that carbon footprint downside I explained earlier because it's, you know, I'm producing less for what I'm putting in. I have to put more in actually to get less in many cases. So those are some of the reasons why we're going to probably see vertical farms for the near future be limited to specialty products, microgreens, herbs, leafy greens, and maybe some berries and some specialty applications like growing for uh, pharmaceutical companies or growing for uh, cosmetics companies. We're also seeing this as, as a possibility. So, you know, it's fine to imagine what else vertical farms can grow, but, but from an economics perspective, keep those three points in mind. Cool. Makes a lot of sense. Um, there's one question somebody asked. Uh, I think the answer is pretty obvious, but the question is, can we do vertical farming without CEA, without a controlled environment? Can we still do vertical farming? Is it possible in open air? Yes, you can. Now, as an open air vertical farm, you're gonna be subject to the elements. So again, mm. like if it's, if it's a sunny day or a hot day, it's gonna affect my crops, but I can go vertical and save space or optimize mm -hmm. space outdoors, I can do it in a greenhouse, I can do it on a wall, I can do it in a garden, I can do it in many ways. But again, what you have to think about is, as you are outdoors, how has the dimension of control changed? What can I control a little bit and what can't I control? So for my previous example, I said, you can control irrigation in an outdoor vertical garden, and that's gonna have a big benefit. 
what you're going to have a difficulty controlling is when it gets too hot or when it gets too cold. So when it gets too cold, you can actually do things like heat the water up. You can create shading and protection, uh, insulation elements that can be pulled on and off. You could do, um, we see this with some rooftop farms like like the Sula Fres one from Paris I mentioned. You can do shading to protect it from the sunlight. You can do different cooling strategies in the farm. I've seen some farms where it's on a rooftop and it's like outdoor vertical towers and there's fans outside just to create ventilation. It's like they're creating, they're trying to create control, so, but they're outside. So it's never gonna be as controlled as the vertical farms you, know, you may be used to seeing on YouTube. But I think that's really cool. I mean, I think it's really exciting that you could actually design these systems. And I'll put in the chat here, we, we have a free like DIY vertical farming system that you know you could do it with lights or you could do it outdoors. You know, it's just basically a foundation for vertical farming and teaches you the principles. And there's free instructions on how to build your own hobby vertical farm, which you know we hope benefits uh, India, certainly, but we mostly provide it for school, schools and, and nonprofit clients. Okay, cool. That's really helpful. I think, you know, this is very uh, helpful. Uh, uh, everybody, and, you know, we, we work with so many universities. We work with mostly higher education universities only. So if any university which actually wants to implement, and, and I'm, I know a couple of them, not only in India, but in Southeast Asia and abroad as well, who would want to implement vertical farms uh, as a methodology to teach their students and also to experiment and also probably to build uh, successful case studies for others to emulate. So please uh, get in touch with uh, Henry or get in touch with us and we'll help you connect with him and you can yeah. explore the possibility of this. Yeah, just to, we, we definitely do that work. We've worked with uh, schools on building vertical farms in them. We've worked with sort of maker spaces that involve hydroponics to think about robotics and IoT. We have a curriculum for middle school age students that we sell where people can teach urban agriculture and food systems. And we have activities that we sell related to Plus Farm as you build it and operate it. And then our software is just an incredible education tool to match all of that. So yeah, definitely. If you're looking for consulting on planning, I would say a premium vertical farm, or if you're again, education institution, or if you're considering investing in one and you do diligence, you know, definitely look at our services because we have a range of services that we provide to help people out and, and get them forward, moving forward. Wonderful. That's the whole idea. Um, that's the intent of this masterclass so that we can find like many people, interesting people, interested people who are actually want, actually want to explore this uh, and have an initiative over there. Okay, cool. Uh, is there, Aditya, uh, okay, there's, there's one serious startup guy. Is there a possibility to find any angel investor or any kind of financial aid to start such venture for a facility inclined to research? Aditya Pratap Singh. Henry, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think like, Many, many of the clients we work with and many vertical farms I see, they do have angel investors to begin with. Some of them do crowdfunding. There's lots of things. But if your focus is on research, yeah, what's the question? Maybe you don't want to reveal it. But, you know, there's companies that have been built that are focused on innovating one part of the system. Um, one company I looked at was focused on like an easily deployable vertical farming technology. And so they built a farm for just to test that and to prove it. Um, another one, you know, was focused more on seeds. So how do you breed seeds for indoor farms? Again, you need a facility for that, but that's a, a relatively investable idea. So yeah, absolutely. You know, there's a lot of other parts of the sector that's not the farms. The farms, I think, are the biggest, the most important part, but there's new substrates that are needed. Uh, that's the thing that replaces the soil in hydroponic farms. Um, automation technology, very expensive to build, but there's definitely options there. There's a lot of new software companies. Um, that even come from India that are providing ERP services and various solutions for managing these farms. I saw the other day, there's somebody built an agriculture uh, chat GPT. We can ask it questions. You know, there's so many things related to this industry. Uh, I've picked sort of services and now we're dabbling in software um, as the things I'm passionate about, but you can build a business that's not the farm. Just keep in mind that it's a smaller piece of the pie. The biggest piece of the pie is the food that's grown and sold. Absolutely. Um, and Aditya, as you know, we have a great startup program in India. 
So you can apply to the India Startup Program. Of course, you can get a grant. Apart from that, you can also look out for ag tech investors. There are plenty of them, uh, and they are really and they are really coming up with investments with promising startups. Uh, I think uh, our question here, Henry. Uh, everybody is saying that you know when we invest in vertical farming, it's a very costly affair. Uh, yeah. uh, it, it's very intensive. It's, it's high energy consumption, high initial investment, and all of that. Is there a way? What is the smallest prototype? What is the smallest POA that somebody can do and then scale it up? For POC, vertical farm? Right? Yeah. What's the smallest POC? Yeah. Look, so as I mentioned, you can build a vertical farm. That's like a microgreens vertical farm. Okay. And you can have a business there. It might cost you $20,000 to start. And you could okay. you can get back your money in a year if you sell those microgreens. That could be something you could build in your garage. Right, the system okay. I shared with Plus Farm, you can build a business around that. That business is small; it's not a big business. But again, that may be appealing to certain people as they want to have a side business, a side hustle. So that's the minimum, you know, related to the farming operations that's possible. And I think that's really cool. Like, when have you ever been able to, in history, you know, build a farm anywhere and actually make some money if you if you plan it properly? And so th that's the smallest size. But look, I think if you're talking about piloting and then scaling up. If I'm if I have a, a microgreens you know business in my garage and I go to investors and say okay I want to build a ten million dollar vertical farm that's supplying all the retailers you know in India or whatever my idea is the investor gonna say well I don't know if you can do that like I don't know if you have the skills to do that so if I want to build a bigger vertical farm my pilot vertical farm needs to be representative of that I need to be proving that I can produce at some kind of scale I need to be proving that I can do processing packaging distribution. So the whole farm pilot and, and design itself is more complicated, more capital intensive, and has to be larger in size. But again, I think that I typically recommend companies, you know, that are trying to produce like the typical product in vertical farms, is like salad mix or like four different types of herbs. So I, I typically recommend people look at 5,000 to 10,000 square feet of a building first step, 10,000 square feet being better. Okay, and, and so it's a thousand square meters as a starting point for the footprint, okay, for the farm. And, you know, start with three, four levels. Don't go too big, et cetera. But again, it really depends what your, your ultimate goal is. If you're supplying more retail direct to consumer, you need to prove that you can grow a variety of products. So, you know, your scale matters, but again, you can do it in 500 square feet, 50 square meters, but you have to have you have to prove that you can grow a variety of these products. If your business is based on an experience, you need to prove you can design something that's beautiful and and marketable and people go to. So it always goes back to the context and you design around that problem. Wonderful. I think this also answers the question where somebody asks how cost of vertical farming can be reduced and optimization can be done over there. So we have seen how the smallest proof of concept can be done here. Um, now, there's one more question that we need to, it's a good question Deba has asked, how do we convince local farmers for vertical farming since this doesn't seem that cost effective? So the question here, Henry, is that when we talk about vertical farming, are we actually convincing traditional farmers to start something or are we talking about new age entrepreneurs or people to start, even if they don't have any experience in farming, they, can, they should start um, vertical farming? So, you know, most of the time, the interest and the actual development of vertical farms is in and near urban areas. And most of the time, the people planting them are not farmers originally. And that's okay. exciting because we want new people in agriculture, but it's also problematic because most of these people, myself included at the beginning, were very naive about what agriculture really takes. If you really want to build a farm like this, you need to go work at a farm, any kind of farm, and just get a reality check of how they work, what the work is like because that really helped me understand and make sure that the ideas that I'm coming up with and suggesting, you know, actually are making an impact and are related to how these systems work and also respectful to the existing farmers that have been feeding us for generations. But I think that there is a case for outdoor farmers, um, you know, to engage in vertical farming. I don't think that they're as aware of it. I think they're very skeptical of it, but I think there is a case for it. One easy example is nurseries. So, you know, a lot of a lot of farms need the seedlings and, and there's benefits to having healthy, 
clean seedlings. Vertical farms can produce seedlings very efficiently uh, uh, and very effectively and in a very clean way. So we're seeing vertical farms actually producing the seed potatoes for potatoes in the field. And, and so we're seeing vertical farming complement uh, conventional food systems. Now, another example of that is the one I gave earlier, where for smallholder um, animal, like people who own a small herd of cows in India, for example, they need high quality feed to keep the cows healthy and nutritious. So they can actually have a small container that grows the grass. It's like they can, they can supplement the nutrition and they can have some independence from the guy who sells it to them. And, and that is gonna strengthen them. That's, that's a vertical farm of some kind on a rural farm. Um, some farmers just wanna use it to diversify their revenue. Right. So, you know, Indian farmers, especially, you know, are subject to market prices. So if I want to have a different revenue stream, uh, in some cases, again, I'm not saying like a big expensive vertical farm in a field, but in some cases, vertical farming that's done in a creative way can contribute uh, to that. I'll give you one example. I was in Fresno, California, where there's a lot of agriculture happening and there's a big citrus grower. And he said, you know, I heard you're the vertical farming guy. Can you come by and see my vertical farm? I said, what? Like vertical farm out here? Like, where is it? So I'm driving, I'm driving. There's just oranges everywhere for miles and miles and miles. And I arrive at this building in this farm. And he's like, yeah, this is my old like washing station where I used to wash some of the product before it went out. We have an improved one. So it's empty now. So I decided to build a vertical farm in it so that I can sell leafy greens on the weekends at the farmer's market. Again, like if you're waiting all year for your price for your oranges or whatever the contract says, your entire business is dependent upon that. What he's done is he's created a new weekly cash flow by converting an unused space into a vertical farm. He likes the technology. He likes to manage it. He's learned to automate things and he manages this whole 1500 square feet of bed space on his own. He just takes care of his own. Sometimes he needs laborers to harvest stuff he doesn't own his own, he brings it to the farmer's market, he engages with the customers. So that's just three examples of how rural farmers can engage with vertical farming. Lovely. Uh, Samsung SM, I don't know your name, so <laughs> you allowed you. So please go ahead, ask your question. Samsung. Yeah, fan of Samsung. Uh, please unmute yourself if you have a question. By the way, we didn't uh, block you. Or, or or throw you away, or I mean, like you know, we, we didn't do that. I mean, like you know, maybe it happened by mistake. So you're most welcome. Everybody is most welcome. Please go ahead if you have a question. Shoot it. Okay. Meanwhile, while you think about it, okay. So I think you know we we will take just one more question, and I think we're almost about time here. Uh, it was, it was it's a lovely session that we have had. We have really you really answered some of the amazing questions around vertical farming. Uh, Samson, I'm just putting you away. Thank you so much for participating. Uh, and <clears throat> there, there's a lot for everyone. I mean, like, you, know, you, you actually you know, covered an expansive content in such a short span of time. Uh, we really love your, your product. We really love what you're doing uh, and how it can help young people, young agriculturalists or young agri students or researchers to actually plan something in this direction, also universities and other organizations to plan um, uh, better initiatives around CEA. Uh, so I think uh, one last question and we will be, okay. So you are in Share, Share Republic, so I think it's, it's going to be your supper time, your dinner time soon. It is. Yeah, soon it's dinner. I gotta feed my dad. <laughs> so sorry about. It. Oh, so sorry about it. Uh, okay, fine. I think you know we're done here. Let's. We've taken almost most of the questions. We have answered most of them so brilliantly. Uh, thank you so much for being such an amazing speaker um, of Adidoro's masterclass. I, I can see the feedback. People really loved everything. Uh, to the audience, this video, this masterclass will be available on our YouTube channel. Every participant will also get their certificate of participation. Uh, we have your emails and you'll receive them soon. Thank you so much once again. Thank you so much for being a lovely audience and blessing Aurora's Masterclass. We'll, we'll make sure that we keep uh, educating everybody about the matters, about the matters that matter the most. So thank you so much, everyone. And good night and good evening, everybody. Thanks, Henry. Thank you. Thank, thank you for you, having me. Henry. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.